All right, more discussion of chemical energy and thermochemistry. Um, we've been talking about phase changes. We're going to continue to talk about phase changes, and we're also going to be talking about temperature changes as well. Um, but we need to do a little defining of what we're talking about. So when we're dealing with heat changes, um, we need to specify what we consider the system. And the system is the reaction or the process. And everything else around the system is considered the surroundings. So when we are observing a chemical reaction or a phase change or something, we are considered part of the surroundings. So we don't want to think about the heat um, being gained or released by us. We want to think about the heat being gained or released by the system itself. And then the system plus the surroundings, all of that is considered the universe in thermochemistry terms. So we really are going to be focusing on the system in these particular processes as we move forward. Now, like I said before, the term enthalpy is heat, but it's at constant pressure. <coughs> So we really can use heat and enthalpy interchangeably because we're not going to be changing the pressure at all. And again, we use the, the um, symbol delta H, delta means change in, to represent enthalpy. Now when we have a negative delta H or um, a negative Q, that means that the reaction or the process is exothermic. And exothermic means that heat is flowing from the system into the surroundings. So when you touch something that feels hot, as the surroundings, heat is flowing from the system into your hand. That's an exothermic process. If the sign of delta H is positive, which means heat is flowing into the system, then that's an or, sorry, an endothermic process. And if you touch something that's endothermic, heat is going to be flowing from your hand into the system. So you would feel a loss of heat as the surroundings and you would feel cold. So exothermic, negative delta H, endothermic, positive delta H. Okay, now we haven't really talked yet about changing temperature. We've talked about changing state, but all of that was happening at a constant temperature. Um, we can also use heat to increase or decrease the temperature of a substance. And to do that, we have to know something called the specific heat of a substance. And the specific heat of any substance is the amount of heat required to raise one gram of that substance one degree Celsius. And as you can tell, some objects require more heat than others to raise their temperatures. Um, metals have very low specific heats, so it doesn't take a lot of heat to change the temperature of a metal, whereas water has a very high specific heat. So you have to put a lot more heat into water to get its temperature to change. So we're going to be using this table as um, constants of specific heat, so make sure you have it handy as we're doing these calculations. <clears throat> All right, so here's our formula to calculate heat absorbed or released. And remember we said that Q and delta H are used interchangeably. So here where we have Q, you could also have delta H. So in our formula, heat equals specific heat times mass times change in temperature, okay? So C is specific heat, M is mass, delta T is change in temperature. And to find the change in temperature, you always take the final temperature minus the initial temperature, okay? So heat equals Cm delta T. All right, so let's look at an example here. In the construction of bridges and sky skyscrapers, gaps must be left between adjoining steel beams to allow for the expansion and contraction of the metal due to heating and cooling. The temperature of a sample of iron with a mass of 10, degree, of 10 grams changed from 50.4 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius with a re release of 114 joules of heat. What is the specific heat of iron? Okay, so let's look at all of the variables that we're given. Okay, so we're given mass. So we know M is 10.0 grams. Okay, we're given the heat released. So our Q, when we release heat, that means it's a negative 114 joules. Okay, um, it tells us how much our temperature changes. And remember, temperature change is final minus initial. Okay, 
So 25 minus 50.4, our temperature change, delta T, <clears throat> will be negative 25.4 degrees Celsius. Okay, final minus initial. And the specific heat is what we're trying to find. So our C is our unknown variable. So we're going to use our formula. Q, negative 114 joules, equals specific heat times mass times change in temperature. All right, so we're going to divide by the mass. We're going to divide by the change in temperature. So we're going to solve for specific heat. You'll see here our negatives are going to cancel each other out, so our answer will be a positive number. And when we solve for specific heat, we will get 0.449. And if you look at our units, joules divided by grams divided by degrees Celsius. There you go. That is the specific heat of iron. Okay, so the next thing we need to look at is called calorimetry. And calorimetry is basically the, the lab process of uh, measuring mass and change in temperature and things like that so you can calculate heat. And the device that we would use is called a calorimeter. Now calorimeters can be fancy. They can also be very simple in terms of just styrofoam cups. Um, calorimeters have to be insulating so that the heat doesn't escape the process that you're doing. It's all contained in the, the actual um, container, the styrofoam cups. So coffee cups work really well for calorimeters. Now if you'll take a look at what's happening inside the calorimeter, um, generally you're going to have a thermometer because you're going to be measuring the change in temperature. Um, you have something to stir with. Okay. Now in here you'll notice that this is filled with water. <coughs> And when you're doing calorimetry, the whole idea is whatever the system is, okay, whether it's a chemical reaction or a piece of metal or whatever, um, if that system is losing heat, if it's releasing heat, where is the heat going? Well, it's going into the surroundings. And in this case, the surroundings would be the water. So if we can measure the mass of the water, the change in temperature of the water, we know the specific heat of the water, we can figure out how much energy the water is absorbing. And that's equal to the amount of energy that the system is giving off. Okay, So for calorimetry, it's very important to know that the Q of the reaction or the process or whatever is going on is equal to the negative Q of the water. However much heat the reaction releases is the same amount of heat that the water absorbs. Or if the system is absorbing heat, the water is releasing heat. So they're equal in amount of heat, they're just opposite in sign. And so um, anything that's happening in the system is equal to what's happening with the surroundings. Okay, So that's going to be our key to figuring out the heat of a reaction or things like that is by measuring what's going on with the water and using this equality. All right, let's do another calculation example with our specific heat. So we have a piece of metal with a mass of, <coughs> excuse me, 4.68 grams. So we can write out our variables. Uh, absorbs 256 joules of heat when its temperature increases by 182 degrees Celsius. So our Q is going to be 256 joules of heat and our change in temperature, it already tells us how much it changes, 182 degrees Celsius, and the question says what is the specific heat of the metal? So <clears throat> our Q, or sorry, our specific heat is what we're solving for. Okay, Now, where did all of that heat come from? Well, maybe it came from the water. Maybe we put it in really hot water. So we're going to use our formula, Q equals CM delta T. <clears throat> so 256 joules equals C times the mass times the change in temperature. We solve for C, so we're going to divide, and we get a specific heat of 
0.301 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now the question says, could the metal be one of the alkaline earth metals listed in table two? Well, go back to, <coughs> excuse me, go back to the to table two, see if there's a metal with this specific heat, and there is, which is strontium. Is strontium an alkaline earth metal? Yes. So the answer to the question, <coughs> could the metal be one of the alkaline earth metals? The answer is yes.